And welcome to College Road Trip. It is our actual show tonight from 5 to 6 on Wednesdays. We always have our special editions during the uh, during the tournament. We had our first special edition show on Monday night. Tonight it's our normal time slot. And tonight filling in for Ryan Thies is going to be Armin Sarian. Thank you very much for joining us, Armin. Oh, you're kidding me, Barry. Great to be here. Great to fill in. Thanks so much. Great to be on my maiden voyage personally with Bruce Sports. What a wonderful organization. What a wonderful setup you guys have going on, Baxter. I have to uh, congratulate you. And what a great time of year. Absolutely. I mean, this is March. This is my favorite time of the year in sports. You can smell that sweetness in the air. Spring is sort of coming. It's Wisconsin. <laughs> and we have brackets galore. And I just love it. I have brackets in front of me all the time. I just have teams and seeds and break down and, or breaking down matchups. It's just so much fun, so I'm really excited to be here. Awesome. We're going to break down the brackets with uh, Jeff Childs in just a little bit from WTKA in Ann Arbor, Michigan, talking some uh, Big Ten as well. Uh, we are an innovative show, so we like having new guests. We like having uh, all sorts of panels and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, it's it's one of those things where we like to talk college sports, and this time of year is our – it's kind of like our Oscar time. It's, it's just awesome. But uh, – First things first, I saw this on ESPN.com, yeah. and I was just amazed. It's 25 years today since the Fab Five. Jawan Howard, Ray Jackson, Jimmy King, Chris Webber, and uh, jo- and Jalen Rose. Yeah, what, I mean, wow, 25 years. What an amazing group that I think really changed the way we look at sports, sports entertainment, and, of course, college basketball. And, and a great group also, I think, on the court, which gets lost sometimes. People focus on the fact that they didn't win a championship, which is sort of a myopic look at it, I think, because when you get to two national finals in college basketball, you did a heck of a job. They barely lost to two great all-time teams. I'm talking about Duke. uh, That Duke team was great. The North Carolina team was one of the great underrated champions, Mm -hmm. I think. Funny, Barry, I just on a whim about a week ago rewatched the 1993 national final, winced, of course, when Chris Webber had that timeout (laughs) moment. You don't see anything unlike that, right? But – Quite an amazing game, really. I mean, that was a competitive one back and forth. Eric Montross. Montross was in that. Uh, Donald Williams was the star for North Carolina. Who had, Antoine Jameson was uh, in there. Too. I don't know if he was on that team, but the funny thing is that was kind of a, a North Carolina team that didn't have a lot of stars, mm-hmm. as opposed to the, you know, the big names of Michigan. Uh, but a, a really competitive, well played game uh, could have gone either way. And and it's just amazing to think that it's been twenty five years. I was nine years old when that happened. Wow. 25 years. I would have been 13. So that's that's we're aging ourselves here. But uh, yeah. you you take a look at that and Bobby Knight, who's one of the greatest coaches in Division One college sure. basketball, he calls them the most overrated team ever. Now you say they're a good team. He says they're overrated. Is there a middle? Is there a middle ground, or is it just one way or the other? Well, I think there has to be. You operate in two extremes with this argument mm-hmm. almost all the time. Right. People look at overachieving, underachieving. You know, there has to be some sort of middle ground of achieving, right? I mean, and, and we know Bobby Knight's sort of a curmudgeon. He's an old school kind of guy. <laughs> but does we still surprise, love him. Does it surprise anybody one bit that he's calling this group the most overrated team ever? This is the opposite of everything Bobby Knight believed in and taught. You know, oh, yeah. He was about no flashiness, no flamboyance. Freshman starting it was a ridiculous concept when he, when he was coaching. I, it's hard, if they went, you know, into college basketball, started five freshmen, which no one had done, and then not made the tournament for a couple of years. You know, not made great players of themselves, NBA players. Then you can maybe call them overrated. But they went to two national finals. Incredible accomplishments. Ridiculous to say they're overrated, I think. And the first uh, the first championship they had, they were a five seed. And, of course, Juwan Howard came out. And after they won the uh, the uh, Final Four game, they came out and said, we shocked the world. So <laughs> that was his, uh, that was his right. thing. But I... Man, 25 years since the uh, since the baggy shorts, since the Black Sox, uh, since they really revolutionized college basketball, and they will uh, they'll tell you that every time you uh, every time you see them on TV. Right. The cultural aspect, I think, is the thing that people focus on a oh, lot. Absolutely. With their impact, mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, they didn't win the championship, but this wasn't just any other team. I mean, they changed the cultural impact on basketball, how kids wanted to dress, how they wanted to market. I remember famously when they came out with dark blue T-shirts instead mm-hmm. of regular warm-ups because right. they knew they were being marketed. Um, without you know, pay. so and those things resonate now today. We hear all the time about the NCAA and uh, uh, different rules and regulations. Should players be paid? They were kind of um, the fledging impetus for all those things. So no, I agree. I agree. Uh, so we have that today. Also coming out on the wire today, Jason Tatum, Duke uh, freshman small forward, coming out and uh, declaring his 
uh, declaring for the NBA draft. He is considered pretty much the top five in most mock drafts. Where do you have him? Do you have him in the top five? Uh, he's definitely a lottery pick. I think you never really know until the lottery comes out and how things are going to shake out. You, you have to figure Mar- Markel Fultz and Lonzo Ball are involved in the top two picks, probably Josh Jackson as well. Yep. If I had to uh, guess right now, I think Tatum would go top five and uh, top ten at the at the worst. He, he's definitely in that mix. And, and that never used to happen with a coach Mike Krzyzewski team. Right. He never had anybody until Elton Brand actually left after his, I believe it was his junior year, wasn't it? He never, I believe so. He never really had anybody leave early, and now he's got freshmen leaving early. This has got to, <laughs> in his old school mind, this has got to just be absolutely crazy. Well, I think he's just adjusted to the and reflected the trend of, of college basketball and the way it's, it's changed. And he's done a... What's make, what makes Coach K, in my opinion, such a great coach is that he's adjusted to all those different styles in the eras. When it became a more one-and-done situation, he adjusted to it. He has a lot of program guys on his roster, the Luke Kennards of the world. Mm-hmm. Even Grayson Allen, in some ways, who was highly touted, a schoolboy legend in Florida, but it wasn't a one-and-done. And then he buttresses that with the Austin Rivers of the world, the Brandon Ingrams of the world, Jason Tatum, as we see now, guys that are going to go one-and-done, and he finds a way to ingratiate them on a roster you know, very well and still create these cohesive units. He's won championships in almost every era now. We have to think about it's that. Just Coach about K. every decade. 93, yeah. 94, 01, and then uh, and just recently a couple. 2012. And then, and then he, then he yeah. beat the Badgers. So, <laughs> yeah, tough one there. But but you have to give Coach K a lot of credit. Um, but you're right. This was never his style. No, right? absolutely not. Now, you mentioned you have brackets out. Oh, yes. How do oh, your yes. brackets actually look after Villanova lost, after Louisville lost, you know, after Duke lost? How do your brackets actually look? Because we talked about this on Monday. My brackets are okay, but that vanilla, uh, that vanilla, that Villanova <laughs> yeah. loss well, really took a hit. Yeah, I mean, the way mine are shaking out, a corner, it's sort of middle of the pack. I mean, there was a lot of chalk this year in the first round. Especially in the South. Definitely. I mean, this was the, this was the year that you saw nobody above a 13 get an upset, I think. And that hasn't happened in a long time. Very rare. And I think the important thing uh, to remember is the randomness of these tournaments always. You know, so that's why I'm a, I'm a subscriber in the belief that the more you pay attention, the more you watch, the worse you do in these brackets. <laughs> I've never done well in bracket contests. I watch too much. I mean, I overthought things with, like, Wilmington I thought would upset uh, Virginia in the first round, which they had a chance. They were up 21, 8 to 11. Right. I want to toot my horn there, but they didn't finish it out. Well, we were talking on Twitter about that. We were we both uh, started saying stuff when they were up 25 to 11, exactly. and then all of a sudden Virginia came back and took the lead at 28, 26. Right, and and so many of these things come down to one possession, you right. know, and 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 the margin of error is so slim. Things change so quick. So I haven't done great. I haven't done bad, but that's just the way brackets go for me always. Who is your MVP from this past weekend? And and to tag on that one, who is your most impressive team? I don't, you know, I really love what Frank Mason does at Kansas. I think great teams in the last 10 years that have won championships have done it with a great veteran point guard. And Frank Mason can do so much from leading a team, getting to the rack from outside. He's really had a great first two rounds. Most impressive team, I still lean with Kansas. Of course, Wisconsin with an impressive win over Villanova, who I think got this, kind of got screwed the most in the seeding situation, as my earbud goes. <laughs> I'll fix it. Don't worry. I'll figure it out. I can still hear it. It's not a big <laughs> It's not a problem. It's all right. We get all we get these flops all the time. But how about Michigan? What a run they've been on. Absolutely. Mo Mo Wagner. I love this guy. <laughs> Mo Wagner. Mo Wagner. The man from I, Germany. I think Baxter loves Mo Wagner. Yeah, from Germany. How about Mo Wagner? What, and uh, the best thing is John Beeline told him, look in, look in the camera, buddy. Say hi to all your family in Germany. I'd and like goes, to say hi to everybody uh, back in Germany. This is like, a no, dream come true. No, no, I'm happy. Thank you very much. <laughs> I love Mo Wagner. 26 points. What a great game. Boy, that team, Walton, DJ Wilson, what a, what a threat they've been from the outside and the inside. And after everything that happened in that, uh, that plane incident, they've been playing pretty amazing basketball. That's been an amazing team. There's so many to look for, but those are the ones that stick out for me. I like UCLA a lot as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, what you did is what we in the biz call a segue. And yes. we're going to segue right to uh, Jeff Childs from WTKA in Ann Arbor talking about Michigan. And, Jeff, thank you very much once again for joining us. We had you on as a panelist last week talking about the uh, the beginning of the tournament. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the middle of the tournament. But we were talking earlier, and I know you could hear us a little bit. 25 years since the Fab Five. Did you don the Black Sox 25 years ago? Yeah, it's a, it's a special time. Can you guys hear me? Oh, we yeah, got you, buddy. Yeah. Got you. yeah, it's a special time. And uh, you're right, it's a special time for that anniversary. Uh, I was only about five or six when that team played. But the way they changed the game, I mean, you hit on it. That's absolutely right. The, the shaved heads, the black socks. I said they were overrated. But you know what? I mean, I think they carved out their own cultural niche in their own way. I mean, even though they never won a Big Ten championship, the Big Ten was 
pretty balanced back then in the early 90s. Even though they didn't win a championship, they got to two Final Fours, and uh, even though the banners might not exist anymore, it might be taken down from Chrysler, uh, what they did to put five freshmen on the floor and, and really do it, and, and I remember Steve Fisher did that at the start of the year against Notre Dame, and to do it that early and then to ride that wave the rest of the way, I mean, that was a special, special team. Talking with Jeff Childs, WTKA in Ann Arbor, Michigan. If you have a question, if you have a comment, please, by all means, comment on our Facebook uh, Facebook Live right down here where it says comment. Comment on it. We'd love to hear your comments. We'd love to hear what you have to say. But, Jeff, getting into the tournament, uh, the Big Ten, you know, you're a Big Ten guy. We're Big Ten guys here in Wisconsin. Uh, was the Big Ten really misseeded, or did the committee kind of get it right? Uh, I think that uh, I think the Big Ten was for the most part misseeded. I thought was I thought Minnesota was way too high of a seed, and that showed in their you know in their first round game that they played and their loss to Middle Tennessee State. And then you know you look at Wisconsin. I thought they were tragically tragically underseeded. They played Michigan tough each time they played them. They, they have such a deep and a balanced team, and they, the way they played shooting the ball, the way they can guard down low deep and half. That's a complete complete team. I thought the committee vastly under underseeded your Badgers there. Three Big Ted teams left: Purdue, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Do any of them have a chance at a national title? Boy, you know it's a, a very difficult question. You put me on the spot, <laughs> and, and not trying to be the homer here because I'm a Michigan guy, but just the momentum and the wave and the emotional wave that Michigan is riding is is so different. And and I thought, to be honest, against Louisville, I thought that would kind of peter out for the Wolverines, but they continue to shoot well, and they were such a threat from, you know, one through five, any position on the floor. I mean, you talked about Mo Wagner. This is a guy that, yes, he can hit the outside shot, but even when uh, the threes aren't falling for Michigan, they only hit six in that Louisville game. They showed when they get the ball to D.J. Wilson and specifically to Mo Wagner, he can put the ball on the floor, he can make moves around the rim and in the paint, he can do double moves in there and get around defenders. So he is such a difficult player to defend. And so for Michigan, you know – if they get by, uh, if they get by Oregon tomorrow night, I think per, I think Kansas is going to be a huge, huge challenge. If of course the Jayhawks get by Purdue, that's going to be a tough matchup for anybody. I like Wisconsin beating Florida. Florida sort of uh, didn't have the biggest challenge in their uh, in their win over Virginia. The Cavaliers scored only thirty nine points. So I, oh I, no, they did not. That's, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Aren't you Jeff. just happy? No, I'm sorry, Jeff. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I'm just glad that we don't have to watch Virginia's offense in the tournament anymore. Oh, just thank true. goodness. I mean, I, I, you know, Wisconsin's a, a low-tempo team, as we all know, but Virginia's offense is just difficult. It's difficult a difference. You know, I think I think Michigan. I think Michigan can. You know, the the the, the Homer part of me would like to say that Michigan gets to a Final Four and rides this way, but I don't know if anybody can beat Kansas with the way they're playing, with the depth they have. It, don't get on them early. They will just knock you to the mat, you know, knock you down for the count. So that's going to be tough for Michigan. I, I would like to think that Wisconsin best road to get to the final four out of the Big Ten because I honestly don't see Purdue beating Kansas. You know, I, I was just going to ask you about the Purdue Kansas matchup, and I have to agree with you a little bit. And I was a little bit. I was going to ask you of these three Big Ten games, which one of the best chance of winning at least this week? I like Michigan's chances a lot against Oregon. I think Purdue will have a very tough time with Kansas. Uh, even though I love uh, like Purdue's team, we just saw them in Milwaukee, uh, and that Iowa State game was incredible, uh, and and you know pretty impressive the way they weathered a storm there. They gave up an 18 point lead, but found a way to get it back. Wisconsin, I think, has a good shot to be Florida, but Florida's playing very well, so I wouldn't make them the favorite there. Uh, do you think Michigan of these three games has the best chance to win this week, this weekend? Of of their game coming up? Yeah, of the three Big Ten games. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, Oregon's a team that they just lost Chris Boucher. He's their big guy in the middle of their five for the Ducks, and he's a huge, huge loss for them. But you go down Oregon's lineup, they only have really three players uh, above six foot nine. They're a small, small lineup. They have a, really a four guard lineup that they put out there. And to be honest, I mean, Michigan and John Beeline have a tremendous ability to adapt to what other teams do. So if Oregon's going to switch on the big man and, and force, you know, force Oregon's big men to essentially guard Mo Wagner and DJ Wilson. I mean, I would take Michigan in that matchup every time because Oregon, as I said, small, small lineup. It's going to be really tough against Michigan. They can shoot the ball as good as anybody as Michigan. You know, they played Oklahoma state. That's another team that likes to get out and transition and get up and down the floor. Michigan has shown that they can beat teams in a shootout. They beat Louisville in a, in a slug fest in a game in which they had to come back. So Michigan has shown that, Sort of almost like a chameleon way of adapting to the opponent and adapting right. to 
what the other teams do, and they can combat that. Well, what I, what I like about them, too, and I don't mean to jump on you, Barry, yeah. but I, I love the way that they can shoot from almost every position. And that's so valuable in today's game, and that's so valuable in a tournament setup that you can have shooters at a, at a threat at all times. Obviously, um, if you can increase your three point efficiency, you have a better chance to win. And uh, I'm just curious. Yeah. I'm just curious how everybody's going to be focusing on Dylan Brooks, but now Tyler Dorsey has finally stepped up yeah. for uh, for Oregon. He's averaging twenty twenty one points a game, and he's shooting seventy eight percent from the field. I mean. How are they going to stop them? What does Michigan have to do? Do they can they really focus on just one person, or you know, do they double up on Tyler Dorsey, let Brooks go? What what are they going to do? Yeah, I mean, you said it there with Brooks and Dorsey. I mean, these are guys that can shoot the ball from anywhere, similar to Michigan. But as I said, I think the size uh, might give Michigan the the difference in this game defensively. I think Michigan has been playing a lot better uh, guarding against the three. That was a problem for Michigan earlier in the year. They would get just bombed from outside. And Oregon shoots a lot of threes. I think Dorsey's hitting like 41% right now. Oregon, really, really good three-point shooting team. They're one of the best in the nation. But Michigan has shown a better ability schedule and in the tournament really to close out on the three. So if Michigan can shut down the three, if they can you know, let DJ Wilson and Mo Wagner loose, unleash them and let them do their thing, I think Michigan advances. I posed this question to Armin just before. Who is your, uh, who is your MVP of this past weekend? Uh, and... Who did who who disappointed you the most, either player or team wise, uh, from this first weekend of the tournament? Well, I think as far as the disappointment, I mean, you have to go with Villanova, the defending national champions, and they just they let Wisconsin dictate that game to them on both ends of the floor, and they were really out of sorts in that game, and they had to make a charge at the end to try to come back, but it all went for not good win for the Badgers, but I think that's a huge huge disappointment uh, for Villanova, and then and then as far as the weekend. That's a tough one. I mean, I think you have to look at uh, Frank Mason against what he did against Michigan State. That was a close game in that game with the Spartans, but Kansas sort of pulled away and made that one look a little more wide of a margin than it really was. So I have to go with uh, with uh, Frank Mason in Kansas. Man, I'm outvoted on that one. I said Tyler Dorsey. I just said just the way he's been shooting. Well, he's, out, he's played well. He's definitely yeah. played well. Upset special. I don't know what you guys are thinking. I really love Xavier. Now, I don't think I'm going to pick them to win. I didn't in my bracket to beat Arizona. But the way Xavier's been playing, a tough team from a tough conference that had a lot of trials and tribulations throughout the end of the year, that's finding a way now. I think of the teams left in the tournament, if you were to reseed 1 through 16, they'd be the worst. But I would not want to play them because I think they have a chip on their shoulder and they're going hard. Do you see there's any, if there's any chance for Xavier to beat Arizona, Jeff? And I don't know what you look at for some of these other uh, matchups. Um, what you think, you know, maybe a, an upset special would be or or um, one you really feel strongly about. Yeah, I'm not really sold on, on Xavier beating Arizona. I am, however, really intrigued by the uh, the West Virginia matchup and their game coming up in that game. That's going to be a really interesting clash of styles. Of course, West Virginia, the press Virginia moniker that they have. They're a really good defensive team, excellent defensive team. They, they showed a lot more of their shooting ability in the Notre Dame game. I like West Virginia. To, uh, to pull off the upset in that game. I have to go with that upset. Yeah, and I also think – Good take there. I think to add to that – sorry about that. Um, to, to add to that point, I have UCLA in the Final Four, and while Kentucky was really good in that Wichita State game, uh, I think Lonzo Ball and, – and I saw UCLA play Michigan early this year – I think UCLA will beat Kentucky, and I guess you can call that an upset, but I have the Bruins getting to the final. No, I agree with you. I think UCLA is going to win this game. I love them. I I think this is five good players uh, on, the, on the floor that can all score. I think Kentucky's got some talent, but they're young. They barely made it through Wichita State. It was a good team. But UCLA, I love that pick this week, and I think that's the one. If you were going to liquidate your 401Ks, <laughs> sell your baby clothes, put it all on, on UCLA for this weekend, I would do it. <laughs> I agree that, that your baby clothes, <laughs> your baby bottles, not not anybody, and his baby, yeah, period, whatever, you know, <laughs> college fund, whatever it takes, sell it back. We we got uh, you were talking about Xavier Trayvon Blewett is absolutely shooting lights out and really being the leader for that team, and I I don't see them getting past Zona, but uh, because I have Arizona in my uh, sure. in my Final Four, but they've had a a great run so far. Uh, you're right, UCLA. I've got them in the final four. I think they're going to be Kentucky. I think the uh, the X factor is going to be Bryce Alford. I've said that all throughout when we've been picking games. So uh, let's uh, let's do this, Jeff. Let's go one by one here, and let's go region by region and see what we can do. We have uh, we did this last week with the panel, and and we enjoyed it. And I know a lot of other people did. A lot of people out there did. Um, 
Let's take the East region first. Your first game we got that we're going to talk about is our beloved Wisconsin Badgers against the Florida Gators now. Of course, Armin and I both have Wisconsin. And uh, what, what about you? Do you have Wisconsin moving on to the Elite Eight as well? Yes, I do. And it's not just Big Ten homer. I promise it's, a, it's an objective pick. But Wisconsin, and I don't think – I said this earlier about Wisconsin in the tournament. I don't think other teams – you know, that don't play in the Big Ten or see Big Ten teams can really understand how good this Wisconsin team is, and they might overlook them a little bit, I think, from the Gator perspective. Wisconsin has shown it all year, whether it's Bronson Koenig or Nigel Hayes, they have an innate ability to hurt you inside and outside and really, uh, you know, just possession you to death, you might say, with holding on to the ball like they do and really pick their spots offensively so I have the Badgers moving on right they but they haven't dominated all year in a lot of games and they haven't had any big wins and I think that's why a lot of people slept on them or at least didn't expect too much because if you look at their if you look at their season and I followed you know their season a lot if you look at the games they won they didn't look dominant in any of these games they were sort of like during high school you remember from hang time yeah the great show hang time they learned their <laughs> lesson and win by two no matter what happened at the end of the game and that's why I think a lot of people slept on this team but they found a way to win and they keep finding ways to win uh, in ways that it just bleed their opponent out. Well, the reason I had them going as far as they did was because of their last win against Minnesota. I mean, Minnesota was coming in. They had won 21 straight, and it was, uh, you know, they were dig- arguably the hottest team in college basketball. And Wisconsin beat them by double digits. They beat them by, like, 20 almost. And I think that's why I picked Wisconsin. I wasn't real sold, and I know a lot of people right. around here weren't sold on Wisconsin because they had lost five out of six in the last uh, in the last month of the season, and that's I think a lot of the reason why the selection committee looked poorly upon them too. But you, you hate for Villanova to see Wisconsin in that uh, in that round of 32, but they did, and they saw what Wisconsin can do, and I still think they're going to be uh, they're going to be moving on. On the bottom of that bracket, you have South Carolina and Baylor. South Carolina, the darling. Of that uh, of that bottom side of the bracket, Baylor. I was kind of surprised. I thought they were going to lose to SMU. I thought SMU was going to have a better showing, but uh, I have Baylor moving on in this one. Armin, I don't know South Carolina. Can they get past a Baylor team? Well, I think they can do it, but I don't. I don't see it happening just because I think a lot of the success they had, and it was great, was buoyed by that home home crowd situation. Right. I mean, they had two of the best offensive halves of anybody in, in the second half of the Marquette game and the uh, Duke game, of anybody in this tournament. And they had come in as the worst, off, one of the worst, I think the worst offensive efficient teams, one of the worst teams in a lot of offensive numbers. So this isn't a team that all year has dictated that they are a great offensive team. Now, with Sendarius Thornwell back, everything changed. He had missed a lot of games, uh, threw some off-the-court issues. I think he had an injury maybe. So things could be different. Boy, did they got, get out and defend, though. I mean, they get in your grill. They're checking your breath for 40 minutes, and it's really impressive. It can take anybody out of their game. But I just have a feeling this is going to be the worst game of the weekend. I don't know why. I just feel like maybe South Carolina, you know, kind of shot it all there. I don't know if they're the same on the road. Baylor's never been an exciting team to watch except for the bright yellow Highlander jerseys. Yeah. Um, but you got I, that in Oregon, too. Right, exactly. I think they can do it. I don't know if I expect them to do it. You know, I, it, it's possible. I still have Baylor winning this game. Jeff, what about you? Yeah, you know, I, I think you had a point there uh, right at the end about – has South Carolina really have they sapped their emotional energy after right. that win for Duke? You know, getting their first tournament win in 44 years. I mean, hats off. That's an incredible, incredible accomplishment. I'm going to be honest. I haven't watched Baylor a lot this year. It's been a lot of the Big Ten, a lot of the ACC. But South Carolina, I mean, with Sandarius Thornwell, you mentioned him. He's been one of the most dynamic players. And, and check me if I'm wrong. I think he's still leading the tournament in scoring. He might be up there. So uh, is that enough to get them over Baylor? I'm not too sure. I don't know. But if we're going to have to go with an upset, none of you guys have picked it. I'll go with South Carolina. Wow. Okay. Well, yeah, it's going could to happen. Green. It could happen. Absolutely. They can, they've can. they shocked people before, and they definitely shocked, uh, shocked Duke this past weekend. Moving out west, you have Gonzaga, West Virginia. Uh, we talked a little bit about this. Uh, you guys did. I, I like Gonzaga to win this one. But I tell you, when it comes to tournament play and coaching, Bob Huggins, I, I've met the guy at a coaching clinic. He is one of the funniest guys in the world. He is, knows his X's and O's. I just have a tough time seeing Gonzaga coming out of this with a real easy victory. I think this is going to be a two- or three-point game. You know, I have to agree. I don't know what Vegas has in this game, but I wouldn't be surprised at all if West Virginia is the matchup. I should have uh, checked that. But I think boy, it's Gonzaga by three right now. Okay, but boy, boy, does Bob Huggins know his way around a tournament, though, and the way his team can get up in you and defend for 40 minutes, that full-court uh, team. You know, the Gonzaga is always such a question mark, right, come March, because you never know what's going to happen with them because of the competition they played all year. 
and it's it's not something that's a good barometer of how they'll do in the tournament. They never seem to make it all the way. They're always a top seed, but they never seem to make it all the way. I expect them to lose somewhere, and it could very well be this weekend. I could see West Virginia winning this game. Jeff, what about you? Yeah, I, yeah, I could as well. I mean, we talked about West Virginia's press, and, and I watched them against Notre Dame, Notre Dame in that Saturday game last week, and they were so, so effective. At, right as you said, getting up in your face, being defending, moving their feet, so, so good defensively. I think they could pull it off against Gonzaga. Gonzaga has not seen a, a defense like this playing in the WCC all year. But uh, I'm going to have to stick with the Zags here. I do have Gonzaga winning the national championship in my bracket. I'm going to hold fast to that. Okay. I, I see that. That's why I'm... you got to stick with your picks. Well, yeah, and when we talk about the Midwest, we'll talk about my winner. So uh, we talked about Xavier and Arizona a little bit. Uh, does the does the shoe finally drop for Xavier? Does the does the uh, does the glass slipper finally come off, or does it, do they stay wearing it all the way to the Elite Eight, Jeff? Yeah, I think it's over for the Musketeers here. I mean, Arizona's been so so talented in the Pac-12, one of the you know one of the one of the best leagues in the country this year. And, and I don't see Xavier really hanging with Arizona in this game. I think the Wildcats roll in this game, to be honest. I'll pick Arizona, but with great trepidation. I think there's a way Xavier could win this game. I think they're playing hard, but it's it's probably going to be Arizona. So I'm picking Arizona. If you had to, you know, if you had to put money on it, yeah, I definitely had to pick Arizona. Yeah, I have Arizona in my final four, and I. I can't go against Arizona, especially against an 11 seed in right. Xavier, who comes out of you know comes out of the Big East and and has had a great run, but uh, but I honestly think that it's over and I think that uh, carriage is turning into a pumpkin at midnight. So uh, we take a look at the Midwest, Kansas Purdue, one of the most intriguing matchups we see. Caleb Swanigan, you have two potential players of the year in Caleb Swanigan against Frank Mason. Uh, wow, it, it, just an intriguing matchup. I I have Kansas winning. The entire thing, and it's hard to go against them, especially with Josh Jackson and Frank Mason. You got some guys that can really play. Um, I I don't see this as even really a close game. I think Kansas wins at least by ten. Yeah, I have Kansas as well. I expect uh, to win the whole thing. I expect them to win this game uh, against Purdue. Purdue really impressed me for most of the game uh, against Iowa State, Milwaukee, until they kind of they were kind of melting away. They were kind of self-destructing um, in the second half. Now, a lot of that was the Iowa State contingent in Milwaukee, but I was also very impressed with the way they settled things down, had good possessions at the end to win. Caleb Swanigan is one of the great uh, forwards in the country. I love the way he works from the high post, really good out of their horn set. He passes, he shoots, he does it all. But I think Kansas is too tough from every angle. Kansas has a great, great point guard in Frank Mason. They have a great player in Josh Jackson. They have so much more. Kansas is my pick. I think Purdue a great season, but I think Kansas is going to win this game. Yeah, I, I'm in full agreement with you guys. Not to mention, you know, this is essentially in the Jayhawks' backyard here in Kansas City, Missouri. No doubt. Uh, four games on the year. This is one of the best teams in college basketball for a lot of the reasons you mentioned. One of the best point guards in the nation in, uh, in uh, Frank Mason for the Jayhawks. And Purdue, well, well, I don't think Kansas will win this game going away. I think Purdue is going to stay in it for a while. If they if they play that too big lineup with Swanigan and Haas, it might uh, might uh, you know shy away Kansas's guards from being in the paint in this game. That might keep the Boilers close for a while. Uh, but if if Purdue is going to pull this off, they would need a monumental upset. Gary scoring from Vince Edwards, who's a pretty good three point shooter, but. I just don't see Purdue having enough artillery to hang with the Jayhawks. Yeah, I do like Isaac Costo. I think he's the Ivan Drago. All right, <laughs> yeah. if he dies, he dies. Okay, he looks like Ivan Drago. He does. And when he, he gets a low in the block, you can't beat him. When he's in there with Swanigan, they work the high post and the low post, the two man game. It's very good. Uh, I don't think it'll be enough to win, but I don't I, think so I, yeah. either. But they, it is fun to see two bigs play a high low, a high low game, especially against a zone when they can get uh, something into the short corner and then right down underneath the basket. I did pull up the odds. I, I was happy enough to see Vegas dot com. Uh, just to answer your question, Gonzaga is favored by three, Kansas favored by five. Now this next game that we're going to talk about, and this is tugging at your heartstrings here, Jeff. <laughs> Michigan is actually favored by one. Over Oregon, I have Oregon winning that one. I have had Oregon winning that one. I haven't had Michigan going too far, but you know they've surprised me, and they seem to be the team of destiny so far this year. Yeah, you know, and, and again, I'll preface this by saying I swear this is not a homer pick. Uh, <laughs> I honestly think kind of like Donald Trump. I be- believe me, believe me, right? Yeah, yeah, gotcha. No, I, I really think Michigan is a more complete team here. Especially, I mean, it cannot be stated enough how big 
no pun intended, how big Chris Boucher is for Oregon because he essentially changes that lineup. I mean, with him in the lineup, they have, you know, I think four or more players above six foot nine, six foot ten. He really changes that for Oregon. Can be playing with a very smaller lineup compared to Michigan. And as I said, they bring out the four the four guard rotation at times in their lineup. I just think Michigan has too many shooters for Oregon in this game, and they can hit shots inside, they can hit shots outside. Difference in the game, I think Michigan defense if they can prevent transition opportunities against Oregon, which the Ducks like to do, and if they can run off, um, if they can run off Brooks and, and the rest of Oregon's three-point shooters off the line, that is going to make a difference because if you force Oregon, you know, from what I've studied up on them, you force them to, you know, another jump shot. If they're shooting jumpers all day against Michigan, I'll take that matchup anytime. I think John Beeline's got the special sauce going for this one. I don't know what it is, but uh, that Michigan team's playing well. I expect them to win this game. I really do. Should be interesting. It's going to be a good game. I think all three Big Ten teams have a good shot at winning, save Purdue. I think Purdue's just going to get manhandled by Kansas. That's just my thought. And now watch Kansas will get outed right. by. It's, it's March. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You never know. The more we know, the more we don't know. Uh, moving down south. In the southern bracket, it's all chalk. You have the one, two, three, and four seeds moving on. First game we want to talk about, UNC against Butler, North Carolina, the biggest favorite of the weekend, favored by seven and a half. I have UNC moving on. I just can't, uh, I just can't go against Roy Williams, Justin Jackson. They, they have some great talent down there, and, and uh, who's the uh, – uh, Kennedy, Kennedy Meeks. Yeah. Um, you know, he's fun to watch, too. They have some great athletes, and I really see them moving on pretty easily. I have uh, North Carolina winning this, too, but do not sleep on Butler. They beat a very tough MTSU team. I think they're a very good team. They've had a good team all year. They've got a lot of shooters. They know how to win games. I remember, I think it was in Maui a few years ago when they manhandled North Carolina. Now, obviously, mm-hmm. that was years ago, different teams. But I don't think they're going to be coming and be totally intimidated. Now, there's a size factor there. Um I do expect North Carolina eventually to pull this one out. But they had plenty of trouble last week, North Carolina did, in surviving against Arkansas. So we'll see what happens. They're not infallible. Yeah, you're certainly right. They did not look invincible in that game against the Razorbacks. And Justin Jackson's another guy that, you know, well, they have a lot of talent across the board. He's the guy that could be the difference. I think of all, you know, the one seeds remaining, uh, North Carolina might be the most ripe for an upset. I'm not going to call it. I think the Tar Heels move on, but. Butler's been in this position before. They've been on the big stage. Nothing really scares them in the tournament. Uh, Butler will keep it close. I think the Carolina Tar Heels move on. UCLA and Kentucky, the final game we're going to be talking about here on Bruce Sports with Jeff Childs. Thanks to him for joining us from WTKA in Ann Arbor. We talked a little bit about this. We're all on board with UCLA. UCLA is favored by one point, according to the odds makers in Vegas. Um, realistically, I see this one coming down to being possibly a buzzer-beater overtime game. I love this matchup. I think it's a shame it has to occur in the Sweet 16 because I think there's enough talent, star power in this game to be worthy of a Final Four showcase. Um, these are two of the most high, two, I'm sorry, the two of the highest-scoring teams mm-hmm. in the uh, nation this year, especially UCLA, who has one of the top efficiencies uh, in, the, um, in the nation. You know, future pros in this game, obviously Lonzo Ball is the one we talk about a lot. LaVar Ball the one we talk about too much. <laughs> yeah, probably. The one who talks too much. Right. But I think the key to the game might be Bryce Alford, the mm. way he can get out and stretch defenses and shoot, and especially the way Lonzo Ball um, has been passing. Yeah, passing, oh delivering God. the ball, distributing. I just love UCLA in this game. Like I said, just pour it all out of the bank account, put it all on UCLA for this one. Yeah, I'm totally with you guys for a lot of the reasons you mentioned we talked about earlier and, uh, you know, Ball is a great passer. We've seen that lately from him to TJ Leaf. He's been on the receiving end of a lot of those passes. Another really talented shooter for the Bruins. But Michigan, back in I think it was December, and this was as close a game as you can imagine for a while. Michigan with their shooting was right there. But even when Michigan shot their best, I mean, UCLA still won this game by 20 points. That's how good the Bruins are. Uh, set your DVRs, uh, Bruce Sports fans. If you're not watching this. Yes, yeah. These are two teams – they are going to be in transition. They are going to get up and down the floor. It's going to be a track meet, a very, very fast game. I think UCLA's got the experience, and they're a little more talented, a little more depth uh, offensively. 
I think the Bruins pull this one out in a, in a classic. Yeah, get ready for this one. Settle in and then buckle up. It's going to be a race. As Terrell Owens would say, grab the popcorn, grab and, the popcorn and, and just sit back and watch. It's going to be a great one. Well, Jeff, once again, great insight as always. We thank you for coming on College Road Trip once again. It's been fascinating. It's been fun. And we will definitely have you on again within the next uh, week or two to talk about this past weekend and also a look to the uh, Final Four in the championship game. Thank you once again. All right, guys. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks, that's Jeff. Jeff Childs from WTKA in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And some great stuff, man. It's just so fun to talk about and so much stuff. We could pack this. We have to pack this into an hour, man. We could sit here and we could break down each and every game and we could take three hours. This is like, you know, when you were a kid and you bought that juice from Concentrate? Mm-hmm. This is the Concentrate. <laughs> this is the good stuff. This is the syrup right here. Yeah, exactly. We drained all the pulp out of it and we're just going at it with the good stuff. Amazing, though. Amazing time of the year. Amazing matchups. It's been a fun tournament already and it's going to continue to be that, uh, I'm assuming. Absolutely. And you also have the women's tournament going on, too. Yes. Uh, UConn. <sighs> Is anybody going to beat them? No, I mean, UConn's a juggernaut. I don't think anyone's going to beat them. I think one day they'll lose a game. I don't know when it's going to be, but I think one day they'll lose a game. I don't think it'll be this year. But, you know, the, the, women's, uh, the women's side of the things has taken heat over the years for not, being a, not having as much parity, right? Mm-hmm. And UConn is the forerunner of that, you know, the encapsulation of that. But I think there's been a little more this year. I mean, you saw Stanford have trouble. Mm-hmm. Um, they're a very highly ranked team. There were a, a, a f- more than a few upsets in the women's uh, bracket. I, th- I know Marquette locally was a 5 seed. They got upset by Knipiak, which was a 12. Right. And then Knipiak's a Sweet 16 now. Mm-hmm. So um, I don't see anybody beating UConn. They're such a dominant team. and I don't know what you do about that. Well, yeah, and I just saw a note across the, uh, across the wire today that UConn hasn't lost back-to-back games in 24 years. It's hard to imagine that someone could have that much success and know how to handle it. Yeah. I mean, they, 24 years they haven't lost back-to-back games. I mean, they've lost games. They've lost two, three games in a season, sure. but never back-to-back. And that's just a testament to how good a coach and especially how good a recruiter Gino Auriem is. Well, it's in the women's game, it's about recruiting. and I think there's the haves and the have-nots, and I think they've done a great job building a brand that if you are a top-five player, then they're all going there. Right. And you have to give them credit because that's not how it usually goes. Usually great players want playing time, and they won't share it with other great players. So you very, very rarely see many great players coming out of the prep ranks uh, to the same school in the men's game. So is that just is it just a gender thing? Are women more apt to play together, even though they're great? They just want to be part of greatness, or it's just the fact that you're so worried. I think if you're a great high school women's player, girls player, that you will never get a chance to win a championship unless you go to UConn. Right? And they've created this juggernaut that's incredible, and you know. It's it's sort of like they're going to be hated by everybody eventually, and they, someone's got to beat them, right? Right. And and speaking of recruiting, Gino Oriyama this week in his press conference talked about the tough times he's had recruiting women and the reasons for it. We're going to play that entire uh, two and a half minute clip, and then we're going to come back and talk about it. And also, we're going to talk about some of the comments that we have on Facebook. If we could roll that, I just want you guys to take a listen and see what Gino Oriyama has to say. Recruiting enthusiastic kids is harder than it's ever been. Because every kid watches TV and they watch the NBA or they watch Major League Baseball or they watch the NFL, whatever sport they watch, WNBA, it doesn't matter. And what they see is people just being really cool. So they think that's how they're going to act. And they haven't haven't even figured out which foot to use as a pivot foot and they're going to act like they're really good players. You see it all the time. See it at every AAU tournament. You see it at every high school game. So recruiting kids that are like really upbeat and loving life and love the game and have this tremendous appreciation for when their teammates do something well, that's hard. That's hard. It's really hard. So on our team, we, me, my coaching staff, we put a huge premium on body language. And if your body language is bad, you will never get in the game. Ever. I don't, I don't care how good you are. If somebody says, well, you know, you just benched Stewie for, you know, 35 minutes in the Memphis game a couple years ago. Yeah, I did. Oh, well, that was to motivate her for the South Carolina game the following Monday. No, it wasn't. Stewie was acting like a 12-year-old. So I put her on the bench and said, sit there. It doesn't matter on our team. Now, the other coaches might say, well, you can do that because you got three other 
you know, All-Americans. I get that. I understand that. But I'd rather lose than watch kids play the way some kids play. I'd rather lose. And they're allowed to get away with just whatever. And they're always thinking about themselves. Me, 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 me. I didn't score, so why should I be happy? I'm not getting enough minutes. Why should I be happy? That's the world that we live in today, unfortunately. And kids check the scoreboard sometimes because they're going to get yelled at by their parents if they don't score enough points. Don't get me started. So when I, when I look at my team, they know this. When I watch game film, I'm checking what's going on on the bench. And if somebody's asleep over there, somebody doesn't care, somebody's not engaged in the game, they will never get in the game, ever. And they know that. They know I'm not kidding. Okay, that was Gino Oriam. I, I love his, I love his yeah. quote. Yes. Two minutes in, don't get me started. I was started. just going to say, that's my favorite part of it. <laughs> Two minutes in, don't get me started. But he does have a point, and, yeah. and me being a former varsity-level uh, women's basketball coach, he's got an advantage, of course, because he's got All-Americans all the way down his bench. He's got McDonald's All-Americans all the way down his bench. But he's got a point. Definitely. He's got a point that... These kids, all they do is they see what's on ESPN. They see what's on Fox Sports. They see all this stuff going on, all the glory that these people get. But what they don't see is behind the scenes how hard these people work. LeBron James, and I'm just going to take him for example, 18 years old coming into the NBA. Do you think he stopped shooting because he made it to the NBA? Do you think he just automatically got on ESPN because he's LeBron James? No. He worked his butt off, and he still does, even though he, now he's resting. But right. he says, but he needs rest. That's a story for another time. But these kids do not stop working. And they worked their butt off in high school to get to UConn. Okay? And Gino says, well, you've got to keep working your butt off if you're going to play for me. And I think that's a great precedent to set. And that's, I think, why He's got a 109-game winning streak. Why his teams are so dominant. Right. I mean, gr uh, great coach, uh, great players will always tell you the this thing that separated them from the rest was their obsession with the work and with the constant uh, effort and the constant commitment to the game uh, that they put in. Now, I'll say this, and, and he acknowledged it. Gino acknowledged it. It's easier for him to do certain things because he has three other All-Americans and he won't lose his job. There are mm -hmm. some coaches out there that can't afford to not play a great player right. just because they didn't see them smile enough because they are trying to keep their job and trying to win enough games to win, to keep a job, or because that's the best team they can put on the floor. But I think he brings up a good point, and this is just a reflection, I think, of our the times we live in, right, the generation. I mean, it's more about narcissism than anything. Mm -hmm. You know, 20 years ago, no one took a selfie. They took a picture outward, right? right? Now everyone takes a picture inward. It's all about how many followers do you have? Mm. You know, how many clicks did you get? So it's a different I'm checking to see how many views we got. Right, exactly. Yeah. Which is a natural thing because right. that's, how, that's how things have changed. You know, and if, if, technology is a big factor. It's how we that. rate ourselves as human beings. Right. How many people like us or how many people see us on Facebook? How many people uh, follow us on Twitter? And, and being a girls coach, I actually had an incident where I had my top two players – we were playing for, I believe we were playing for first place in conference. And my rule was, if you're going to, the bus pulls out at a certain time, you better be there five minutes before. Otherwise, you're not starting. I had my top point guard who ended up being a first team, uh, first team all region right. and honorable mention all state player, played in college. And another one of my post players who dominated the boards, they were late for the bus. So as soon as they walked on the bus in, in North Carolina, we had to drive the bus, ironically. Um, Barry drives the bus. I drove the bus. I literally drove the bus. Barry drives the bus. Absolutely. I'm the stir straw that stirs the drink. That's a, that's a tough <laughs> thing to drive, though. It's a stick. Yeah. It, well, actually, right? it, was big, it was automatic. Oh, it wasn't one of those yeah, big no, shifters? No, it wasn't oh. a big gear shifter. But I, as soon as they came on the bus, I looked at him and I said, what do you think is going to happen? And they said, we're not starting tonight. So they had it. They knew what, as punishment, right? Yeah, yeah. And they knew that they knew the team rules, and they knew that they they messed up. But a lot of these girls later on, a lot of the teams that I had, oh, you got to you got to get me the ball, coach. Why? Oh, I need to score, or you know, I didn't get enough touches. You know, we won the game by twenty, right? Okay. Oh, I only had seven points. Well, it's not just hey, that. thanks for helping the team. I appreciate that. Once upon a time, you'd never think to ask your coach that. You would no. never broach that question to your coach. No. But times have changed. And generations, not to rip on the younger generation, 
but it's just the way they've grown up now. And uh, I think that you sometimes see the result of that. So you have to try, as a coach, and Gino talks about it, you have to try and fight harder against that mm-hmm. and fight harder to reinstill your values and principles in the program. There is a cynicism I see in this younger generation that you didn't see before. Right. Right, and it's... But where does that stem from? Does it stem from the parents? Oh, I think it's just a generational shift in the world we live in. Oh. Is that too much? I mean, is that too, you know, not to <laughs> that's get too a, that's far a, out that's there? That's pretty broad right there. We're getting right far there. out there, but, I mean, uh, you know, little things add up. Now, so. my, my, my wife claims that I always like to point the blame at somebody, you know, whether, okay. whether it's for, you know, something yeah. internal, something external. You know, somebody's got – she, she says I got to always have to – You have to assign figure. blame to somebody. Yeah, okay. yeah. so I, in this instance, I got to assign blame. And – I have to think I have to assign blame to the parents. Okay. Now, whether I'm right, whether I'm right or wrong, I think is is a moot point because I think for most people it does start at home and it does it does start with the parents. I know one of the last teams I coached, and this is one of the reasons why I got out of coaching, is because the kid coming off the floor when I took her out of the game or when we called timeout, the first thing she did was look up at her parents. And what were her parents do? Her parents would say, shoot the ball, shoot the ball. Right, so they're becoming part of the problem. Exactly. Then, right? They're becoming part of the problem, and they're coaching when we should – when they're the, they should be telling their kids to listen to the coach. I think a lot of the kids that go and play for UConn and go and play top Division One basketball understand that. They know, hey, mom, dad, the coach knows what he's doing. I'm going to listen to him. I'm going to work hard, and I'm going to do my best. But, right, I mean, once upon a time, you the parent would put their trust in the coach. And, right. You know – it would be worse if you talk back to your coach than talk back to your, you know, mother. Now, now they're they're contributing with that and then saying, you know, you should shoot more. Don't listen to the coach, and yeah, then you're creating a problem because you're undermining that authority. Right. So you have to be able to draw those lines. No doubt about it. And the and best teams can probably do that. Yeah, and I think it's the same thing. You know, me being a teacher, I think it's the same yeah. thing in the classroom. They entrust our, they entrust us with their kids, and and we should be able to be trusted with uh, with what we're doing because we know what we're doing. We've been professionally trained to do it. Yeah, and we learn from you every day, Barry. That's why we know you teach well. <laughs> no, we this don't guy, learn from you No one teaches like Barry. Anyway, uh, Baxter says, does Gino yeah. actually recruit or do people just flock to him? I think people just actually flock to well, him. Well, Al, Al McGuire said at the end of his career, he used to recruit, and at the end of his career, he selected. Yeah. And that was a big difference because yeah. then he got the cachet and got the uh, – the gravitas to be able to go in and select the great players because they he built a brand they wanted to attract themselves to. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I mean, Gino Ariema has the, recru- the easiest recruiting job in the nation. He finds the top three players in the nation. He says, I'm Gino Ariema. <laughs> you are going to UConn. And they say, of course, I want to go to UConn. This is the, this place I've dreamed of going. I would think it would be like a fantasy football league draft on his computer. Right. I want him. or I want, I'm sorry. I want her. Her, her, and her. Except he gets all the first round picks. Exactly. He, he's got first. He's got first pick and he got first round picks. But I mean, I wow. mean, you have to give him credit because that doesn't start from nowhere. No. I mean, he he, he is started a great the, the rest of any of them. So he created mm-hmm. that brand, and no one else has built what he's built ever in that game, except for maybe Pat Summit. Okay, we have to give the late oh, Pat Summit credit. I miss Pat Summit. Right. She was such a great coach and such a nice lady. Right. I but, got a chance to meet her too. She was great. It's amazing. Yeah. At this point, though, it's it's Gino yeah. that that's been able to build that brand. So, so if it's not UConn, who is it? <laughs> well, Stanford always is a tough team. Yeah, I I, I haven't really uh, broken down the uh, women's brackets at the top as much as I normally do, but I I would say Stanford is in the mix usually. And now they struggled early on to to make uh to surpass their first round game. Right. Um, I watched. Uh, there was another game I watched. South Carolina was a top seed who had had a couple important injuries. And I'm not sure if they're going to, um, you know, they're in the Sweet 16. They, they barely won, but they've had some big injuries, so I don't think they'd uh, be a contender. And I forget the other number one seed, but. Um, I want to say Baylor. But Baylor might right. be involved. Yeah, they're usually I pretty good. I just remember good. Baylor with Brittany Griner. So you have to say it's one of those teams that might, if anyone's going to topple uh, Geno and the UConn Huskies, it's them. Am I looking at this right that UWGB is still in it? I'm, I just I just pulled up. You know, the they usually carry the flag. Of the Actually, Horizon yeah, the so. uh, they're they're playing Purdue, which is the number nine seed. Uh, you have Notre Dame, UConn. Notre Dame has always been, especially since Skylar Diggins was there, has always been yeah. in the top uh, top. And it is Baylor in South Carolina. Um, Tennessee still up there, number five. You got Washington and Mississippi. Wow, Mississippi and Oregon State, and two programs that are up and coming. Marquette, like you said, a five seed. Uh, losing to Quinnipiac. Really uh, tough game. They had, a, they had a big comeback effort, and a three rattled out the buzzer for Matisha Heideman. Right. So I was t- doing a little bit of following that team this year. So uh, they had a really tough exit, but a good foundation set by Coach Keeger mm-hmm. and the uh, market women. you gotta, you got to love what Gino Oriema stands for, though. I mean, he says what he can 
And he can say it because he's G O R E M. Right, but he says what a lot of people are thinking. Yeah, no doubt about it. And that's, uh, you know, those principles are a big reason he's had that success. It's mm-hmm. not all about making buckets. Right. You know, it's a big part of it, but it's not all about that. A couple comments we get to on uh, Facebook. Yeah. Uh, a couple people chiming in. Melanie Leon, they think the Badgers are going all the way as well. Maybe some homer picks, but they look, That's they're okay. a team right now that it's hard to pick against mm-hmm. because they seem to always find a way to win. They have a veteran team in March. And they have veteran players who I think have the best record in the last four years of any NCAA tournament team, any team in the nation in the NCAA tournament. I believe they're 13-3 and three in the last four years, which is incredibly impressive. They have the most wins since 2014. Right. That's crazy. Now, Florida's a very tough matchup for them, but can the Badgers really go all the way? I mean, is this a national title team? I, if, they're, if the team with Kaminsky and Decker wasn't a national title team, I don't see this one. And, and that's kind of the way I look at it, yeah. too. That's, I mean, Bronson Candy, God love him. He is the, one of the better point guards. And I, I didn't realize this until I actually watched a video of him. I think it was yesterday. I didn't realize he got recruited by Duke and North Carolina after he had already committed verbally to Wisconsin. So that just goes to show you what kind of level he's on. He was highly touted coming out of high school. There's no doubt about it. The interesting thing about Bronson Koenig is that he's had a sort of a, cat, a little bit of a lingering calf injury this year that kept mm-hmm. some of his numbers down, and he wasn't wowing people most games. But when the lights are brightest and it's time to shine, he always finds a way to make those big shots, make those big plays. I never really believed in clutch per se as a stat, as a skill, but if there was some sort of strain of DNA – of clutchness, Bronson Koenig has it. Because yeah. if you look at his numbers this year, they don't wow you. They don't, they don't jump out and say, boy, he's one of the great senior point guards of all time. He's not one of the senior point guards of the nation. But is he the best one left in this tournament right now? I would think so. He's close to it. He's I'd say Frank Mason's up there. Yeah, but, absolutely. But, I mean, he's close to it. So th- and this is a guy that just knows how to show up in winning time. Absolutely. Uh, Aaron says, I don't see UW winning the big dance. Uh, Sue says, it's time for a new champion in the women's bracket. Uh, I think a lot of people would agree with her on that Well, one. probably. Yeah. I mean, I think we'd all like to see a little bit of difference. A little bit more parity. I mean, not maybe, and maybe not as much as, uh, as the men's side. But they do say that this win streak is good for women's basketball. Why? Because it gets people talking about it. Gets it gets attention. Yeah. And, and obviously it got our attention, too, because uh, we've been talking about UConn for the last you know, 10, 15 minutes. So right. it, it, it can't be all bad. It, what do they say? Any press is good press. So whether it's, uh, whether it's positive or negative, it's not, uh, not necessarily going to be that bad. Aaron also saying he remembers when UMass was great. I don't know if he's talking to UMass women or UMass men. I'm I, assuming he means the Marcus Camby UMass games, uh, I, the days in '96. So. The uh, not Burke Patino was a Providence coach. Oh, Calipari coach. Yeah, that John team. Calipari. Yeah, he did. Of course, those officially didn't happen because they're vacated. <laughs> right. John Cal ahead of the posse, like he always does. <laughs> and and, and uh, that slick back hair. Him, yeah. and, him and Patino, and uh, who's the other one with the slick back hair that I don't like? Um, I don't know. It was Calipari. It was another. I don't want to. I don't want to put it out there, as you know, because it'll sound racist. But, oh, an Italian guy. Yes, an Italian guy. Um, but but we always said, as a coaching staff, we said, don't ever slick back your hair because people don't trust people that slick back their Not hair. Not Jimmy V. You're talking about a recent. No, coach. no, I'm talking about a recent coach. I hey, love Jimmy Valvano. Rest in peace, right. Yeah, absolutely. His his hair was feathered and lethal. You know, no his, doubt about it. It wasn't. It wasn't really slick back. Um, but uh, just. Unbelievable stuff coming up this weekend on the college basketball circuit. You have the women's Sweet 16 and Elite 8. You have the men's Sweet 16 and Elite 8. Who do you have as your Final Four again? Now, you obviously, one of your Final Four teams is out. So if you had yeah. to reseed and pick your final, final Four team, Final Four teams, who would they be? So I took Duke out of the uh, East to win. They lost. Mm-hmm. Villanova lost. So to come out of that bracket, I'm... You know, I like Florida a lot, actually. I was very impressed the way they beat Virginia. If Wisconsin wins that game, I could definitely see Wisconsin getting there. I don't see, I don't see Baylor or South Carolina making it. So I'm going to take the winner of this game to win the East in that so bracket. So you think if Wisconsin wins, they could go to the Final Four three out of the last four years? I'm done picking against them. Yeah. I'm just absolutely finished picking against the Badgers. They're, like, they're Deering High School. <laughs> yeah. They find a way to win. The Deering Tornadoes. I love that show, by the way. That is a good show. I, I used to time. love that show. Yeah, that was a good show. Man, that was so good on Teen NBC on Saturday mornings. <laughs> Get that was with Saved by the Bell, the new class, though. You, right. But you can't, I don't like the new class. That was a great morning, though. Well, it was still, you'd still watch it. Yeah. Saved by the Bell had a rerun. Then yeah. it was like, 
Hang time. Mm-hmm. Saved by the Bell, the new class in Armenian school started for me on Saturday, so I had to go. You didn't get to get a chance to watch Saturday morning wrestling then. Huh? Right. I, didn't, I was never a wrestling guy. Oh. All right, so back to, sorry, back to <laughs> the okay. West. Uh, yeah, go to the West. Who do you got? I have fight? Arizona in the West. I don't trust Gonzaga. No, me either. And then in the Midwest, um, what am I missing? Oh, Kansas, right, of course. Mm-hmm. And then I believe I have UCLA out of the South. Yes, yep. UCLA. I agree with all those picks. I think the, the winner of uh, the Wisconsin-Florida game is definitely going to win the East. I have Arizona, UCLA, and Kansas, and Kansas winning it all. And we are still uh, running our bracket. Uh, we're, we, you can't sign up for our bracket challenge anymore, unfortunately. But we had a lot of people sign up for our bracket challenge. I'm proud to say that I'm still in the top five. So Congratulations, that, yeah, buddy. <laughs> luckily, I'm in the top five. But... Uh, you know, it's it's one of those things. Like we say, it's the it's the greatest time of year to be a college uh, to be a college sports fan, especially a college basketball fan. Because after this, it's uh, um, co- well, college baseball. Well, opening, oh, opening day. Okay, okay. Opening well, day. I'm talking college sports. Oh, sh- so you don't have you have spring football. Yeah, spring football. The rest don't exist unless you're a big lacrosse fan. Which my dad is. He's watching out there. Is Go he Hopkins. Really, is he well, really he went a, to Hopkins. So real, oh, okay. if you went to Hopkins, you're just a lacrosse fan or you're wow. a doctor, and that's about it. Yeah. <laughs> or both. <laughs> gonna, is he a doctor? Uh, he's not an MD, but he's got a PhD. So. Oh, well, he's technically a doctor. He's, he definitely is. He's, he's a doctor. So a shout-out for, for, for Johns Dad. Hopkins. He's getting a couple minutes here. Wow. Yeah, go, go Blue Jays. Johns Hopkins. Yeah, and and you know what? Ryan Thies would have known that right off the top of his head. That guy is a guru of nicknames. He knows, really? He says he, he claims he knows all 350. I don't know if that's true. That's impressive. That's that impressive. impressive. One of my favorites is the Western Illinois Leatherneck. Leathernecks, isn't it? Leather something? I think it's Leatherneck. Oh, something like that, yeah. It's you know, wasn't there a college one. nickname called the Nimrods, or was that a Wisconsin high school? That was Water's Meat. Water's, Water's Meat. Meat Nimrods. That's right. All right, so I've got one. I've got one are we, is it almost time, Baxter? We got it. We, we got, got, we got a minute or two yet. All right, I've got one more for you. Okay. Indiana coach, who's it going to be? Who's going to be taking the reins in IU? Well, are they going for Steve Alford? I think I, I brought this up on Monday when we had Ian DeMars on, and we also had uh, Christian Heimel on. Yeah. I think that they are going to make a big play for Alford. It's his home state. It's his alma mater. He wants to bring that, uh, he wants to bring that team and that uh, program back to prominence. Right. Like Bobby Knight had it. I think Tom Crean put it on the right track. I agree. But I think Steve Alford is the person to actually take it over the top, and I think that they make a pretty heavy play for him. And I think because Bryce is graduating this year, right. I think he cuts all ties with UCLA, and I think he just kind of moves on. Because you know Lonzo Ball is going to be, mo- be moving on to the NBA. Yeah. You know that uh, that Bryce Alford is going to be graduating. I think it's a perfect time for yeah, him. Yeah, I think that definitely helps. I think there's so much opportunity here. I think Tom Crean got a little bit of a bad rap. He did win the Big Ten last year. Yeah. But um, they're looking for someone to take it to those next heights. Now, Steve Alford, who is an IU uh, guy, he's shown he can have success at a blue blood. I think it makes a lot of sense. I didn't think he was a West Coast guy as it was anyway, but he moved to New Mexico to take that job. Yeah, and that just, was amazing. And then it just started there. So. Yeah. I agree. I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens at IU at the end of the year. But uh, – we're going to have to wait and see because we got a lot of basketball to no be played. And we're going to talk about that basketball coming up on Monday, another special edition of College Road Trip on Monday from 5 to 6. Then we'll be back at our normal time slot one week from today from 5 to 6. My thanks to Jeff Childs from WTKA in Ann Arbor. Also, my thanks to our producers and engineers, Baxter Colburn and David Bobke, and especially to my guest co-host, Armin Sarian. Thank you so hey. much. You brought so much to the table today. It was awesome to have you. Thank you, buddy. It's so much fun. So, much, so great to be on this show, which you're doing a great job with, and so great to be part of the Bruce Sports family, who I hope to... Uh, Keep uh, being in the nest with, Absolutely. so to speak. We'd love to have you back. We can't wait to have you back for uh, for more. So that's going to do it for College Road Trip. We want to thank everybody for joining us on Facebook and Facebook Live. Thank you very much for the comments. We will see you next Monday. You've been watching College Road Trip, produced by Bruce Sports. Good night, everybody.